Some of you might not know this, but this channel started as an interview podcast. Well, more like a personal gaming blog that somehow accidentally stumbled into being an interview podcast. But our first big break was an interview with Patrick Leader coming hot off the heels of the success of his company's big breakthrough, Vast. Since then, Leader Games has both continued to grow and do its best to defy expectations. Initially, that hyper asymmetry was a flash in the pan then that the company could only find success through said asymmetry. The one consistent thing, aside from the top-notch artwork, thanks to house illustrator Kyle Farron, is that every game seemed to strive for something weird, something new. And while we've had mostly high praise of various leader titles over the years, nothing has quite hit the highs of my persistent love of Root, which is why I don't say it lightly or just purely based on hype when I say that ARCs might be their best title yet. But before we get to why, we should get this out of the way up front, because ARCs is both a game that can be played one and done straight out of the box, or it can be played as originally envisioned as a three-game campaign using the behemothian box that is the Blighted Reach expansion. But I wanted to make sure to give arcs as a standalone game a nice fresh fair take so we're going to be covering this in another review and for now we're just taking a look at what is arcs on its own Conceptually simple, Arx is a game about making the most powerful galactic empire by means of resource consolidation, strength, and political maneuvering. And part of the genius of the game is that most of the actions through which you interact with the board are shockingly blunt, but it's the confines of the action system itself and the declarative scoring that gives it such rich complexity. Borrowing inspiration from trick-taking games, each round the lead player plays a suit, which gives them access to a set of actions affiliated with that suit and a number of actions with lower numbers granting more action points. Then after resolving their turn, other players can either play a higher strength card of that same suit and take actions as normal, or pitch another card face down to take a single action of the lead suit, or they can play an offsuit card for a single action corresponding to that new suit. The player with the highest onsuit card becomes the new lead, players continue playing out their hands, after which up to three scoring conditions are ranked, the player count's game end threshold is checked, then the action deck is reshuffled and dealt out again, repeat until the game ends due to points, or five of these cycles called chapters are complete. Now, there's a good bit of nuance here, but in short, your actions let you do pretty straightforward things. You could build cities and starports, the former of which increasing your resource capacities and your ability to produce resources of the affiliated planets, and the latter allowing you to make big movements and build more ships. You know, normally one of the actions is to be able to just move one space at a time per action, but with starports, it's a freaking mass relay and you can just jet around the board until you run into enemy occupied territory. Then there's also taxing to collect those resources from your own or even other players' cities, battle actions to initiate combat against other player ships, or participating in the court where separate actions let you influence putting dudes onto cards in the court then you can take secure actions, which allow you to obtain cards that you have the most dudes on, creating another important layer of administrative area control. But when I say the actions are kind of blunt, it's that there's an immediacy and a sort of lack of resistance to taking them. Taking an action to build a city? Great. It doesn't cost any resources. You just have to use the build action and control the sector and have space to place it. The resources, they're just separate tokens for bonus actions or used in scoring. Have three pips on your red suited card, one of the suits that allows you to move, but the only one that has the secure and battle actions? Well, great! You could use two of those for moving among the board and then a third to initiate a battle with where you move to. Battle actions are cool too. You choose a number of dice which come in safe, risky, or risky, but I'm just 
just trying to steal stuff instead of destroy flavors. Equal team of ships. Roll dice, which determines both the damage you take, sometimes influenced by the amount of defending ships, and then the damage that you inflict. And another cool, interesting, and somewhat blunt aspect of the game is that all ships on the board are just one class of ship. They just all have two health and come in either damaged or undamaged varieties. It all feels deceptively narrow when you've come to expect that your big, chonky space opera games have all its complexity come from the rules rather than from the decisions that you make while playing it. But it's the scoring that drives all things in arcs and is probably my favorite aspect of the game. When playing their card for the round, the lead player can declare the ambition corresponding to the strength of their card, which then takes the highest remaining of the three point scoring tokens, puts it in the ambition box, and all players will be in the running for point awards in that category, from the most destroyed opposing pieces to the most resources and or court cards affiliated with a planet type, or the most captured courtiers through taxing other player cities and that area control mini game in the court. Yeah, when you seize a card with having the majority, everyone else's dudes are captured. The thing is that scoring happens at the end of the chapter, and you as the lead player are by definition taking the first action of this round, giving plenty of time for everyone else to react to your declaration. Not to mention when you declare an ambition, the strength of your card drops to zero, meaning that it's very easy for other players to play the same suit of card, even low cards with higher action pips, and also steal the lead player token. This is key to what makes the game so layered, even with a seemingly restrictive action system and relatively straightforward non-flashy actions themselves, there's so much opportunity and consequence in what you play when you play it and when you declare ambitions. One of the biggest shifts of this game compared to Leader's other most notable titles is that it's more stable at lower player counts. The decision space, along with the Cardbardian play space, is better able to accommodate low player counts with few rules changes. And yeah, three and four players is a little bit more nuanced and does take longer, but it plays surprisingly well at two. Part of this is the way the map is designed with separate sectors, each with their own planets adjacent and other sectors adjacent to one another. It makes for some interesting pathing and cyclical access. Part of it is also that there are different setup cards for each player account that block out sectors of space, both adding a bit of variety to the game state at setup and closing gaps to make the confrontations more cozy. But unlike, say, Root or Oath or even Ahoy, where even with the development of further expansions, if you're only ever planning at playing at two players, you're having to leave a lot of the content in the box or at least have a partial experience. But in this, Arx is in heavy contrast, where it still feels tight and compelling and competitive and like it's still worth digging your teeth in at two. Clearly, I really love this game, from the quirky restrictive action system that through its confines opens up room for so many fascinating gambits, to the striking blend of really old school deliberate actions with some intersecting game design layers that feel completely avant-garde, and the contrast it holds with later games past both in player count flexibility, but also approachability. This is not a simple game but the teach and the rules overhead are substantially lower than Root and Oath, and little accommodations like the rule sheet pamphlets that summarize pretty much all you need to know about the game in four easy to follow pages are really welcome. But it's not just contrast, there's familiarity too. This bears the imprint of an experienced, highly skilled team, designed, developed, and illustrated in a way that's unmistakably helmed by Whirly, Farron, and Leader Games as a whole. And yes, after all this, there is optional and highly encouraged, though outright discouraged for your first player to, asymmetry for you to get your hands on. Leaders and lore cards included in the base game box, but further supplemented through an additional, and dubiously not included, but still 
welcome leaders and lore pack has you individually draft pairings at the start of the game, granting alternate setups and seemingly subtle passives and great consequences, leading to fascinating alternative approaches to play, less defining than those in Root, but extremely impactful given the structure and flexibility of the game. But like most games, and even intentionally so on the part of most leader games, ARCs is not for everyone. This is a game of heavy confrontation, reliant on strong turn-by-turn -turn adaptation, where dedicated adherence to a single strategy will feel stifling, where your actions and opportunities are dictated by a random hand drawn at the start of the chapter, and what your opponents play. Sure, there's plenty of ways to work around the system, in fact it's designed to be pliable, but it comes at heavy cost to brute force things you need to happen in a certain way. Similarly, combat is dice-based, with risk and speculation dramatic and informed, but far from deterministic. And while the game is lavishly illustrated and imaginative, there's a certain emptiness about it compared to its more vibrant and personality-driven predecessors. But the starkness of space serves arcs well. Though I've yet to play The Blighted Reach, because like I said at the up top, I wanted to make sure to really give this a, a shake as it is, to really see how it stands as a standalone game. And yeah, it feels so cohesive that it's hard to believe that it was designed with another concept in mind altogether. Not sporting a blighted reach size hole, making this feel like some sort of compromise half of a game. It feels complete and totally playable as is. And hopefully that opinion doesn't change when we get around to reviewing this big guy here. But that all said, it's hard for me to imagine ARCs ever overtaking Root as my favorite leader title. Both my affinity to the theme and how wildly imaginative the different factions are with their completely different ways of interfacing with the same board space, but it comes very close. And this may be their strongest design yet. A design both more accessible and more cunning, built upon the experience and lessons of the team's prior work. It is meticulously crafted, beautifully presented, and most important of all, it is fun. ARCs is an absolute banger. And that's our review, but let me know, what do you think of these two different simultaneous releases having different concepts for how you might play this game? Does it muddy the waters? Does it make you more excited? Have you played either or both of these styles of arcs? Put it in the comments below. And as always, thanks for watching. Thanks for supporting. Thanks for being such a great community. You know that I've been Jack for the Cardboard Herald.